All right, what's up, champs? It's your boy, Silos in the building with the powerhouse. We're going to be breaking down Novation 101. Properties are in more turnkey condition. Before I get started, does, does everybody understand the concept of a Novation on a property that's in a good condition? Not a Novation that's uh, going to be used for like a fix and flip. That was the first uh, type of Novation that I was like introduced to. And I didn't really think there was another one until recently over the last few months. Then recently I started dialing into it and now I'm going to actually try to focus in on it because I'm a creative finance specialist. I try to focus to maneuver it over there from cash, but uh, I guarantee a lot of us have missed out on opportunity if we have not taken advantage or understand this concept. And so I kind of want to see, or I kind of wanted to see in the side chat, if anybody had, if you understand this concept, can you put yes? And if you don't just put no. And we're going to dive deep and break this break down. And you're going to be like, whoa, this is amazing. This is pretty cool. And then you're going to go back into your CRM, into your pipeline, and you're going to realize there's a lot of opportunities sitting right there. Because at the end of the day, when somebody's open in the market to selling and you identify that, it doesn't mean that you're they're open to working with you and your business model. Or depending on the models you have, maybe one of the models works. But if you only have like a wholesale cash model, right? A wholesale cash offer. Those work really well on driving for dollar leads. If you're going to be virtually pulling leads and you can't see them and they're not distressed, it doesn't make sense for somebody to lowball themselves, right? So it's like at the end of the day, your wholesale cash offer doesn't really bring any value to anybody else but your own business. It doesn't. When you start understanding novations and creative finance, you legitimately are start bringing, you're starting to bring value to both parties because one, you're stepping up to the plate is the biggest thing. You're stepping up to the plate compared to a whole bunch of everybody else who's a real fix and flipper or the, the thousands and thousands of wholesalers that are entering every day, right? And so when you come up on a cash offer or you come up on full terms and things like that and give them at least the terms they're looking for, you provided them value you, and, and a solution. That's the reality of it. And so let's see how many people do understand it and don't. Let's take a look. See, nope, yes, no, yes, 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 no, no, no. All right, cool. Well, I'm just going to break down what I understand. I've only completed one innovations and, um, I'm going to start focusing in. I'm working on a few right now. I'm really trying to make this a priority and crush it with them. I'm going to go ahead and pull up a whiteboard right now. I'm going to break it down. But what I'll do is I'll verbalize this, is that the reality is at the end of the day, you have a wholesale cash offer. And then if you're a fix and flipper, you have a cash offer, right? So those are two cash models. If you understand novation on properties or fix and flip opportunity, you can pay a little bit more than the cash and the wholesale. And then obviously, if the property is in a turnkey condition, it doesn't need to be flipped. You can pay more on a cash offer on, um, on an ovation, right? So those four cash models, whether you knew that or not, right? So now you're like, oh, shit, light bulb turned on, right? So right now you have two more cash models that are actually bringing more value because you're coming up on price, right? So those are your stronger ones if you identify that. Then what I've learned is that homeowners would rather list it or rent it. So you got to disqualify because before going into creative, I've learned this, that creative is the last resort for people. And usually the last thing you pitch anyways, though it usually comes to the table with a solution. That's the thing. So if you identify that they don't want to list it for X amount of reasons and they don't want to rent it for X amount of reasons, it's great to go creative. And you have all those models, right? And then if you're an agent, obviously you can list it or get a referral fee. But now you understand all the models in the way that they can sell the house, keep it and cash flow on it. Now that you know that, now you can provide value through one of your programs. If you understand them all though, that's the thing. And so it's good to just learn them all, right? If you're, like I was saying, if you know creative, great. How good are you and how creative are you? And like, how many deals have you actually worked and underwrote and then put terms together and got accepted? So then- you really can really start diving deep because in creative, you can literally like trade things in there, like dogs and animals and cars for, for, for houses and things. It's just whatever the hell you want. No bullshit. I've seen crazy stuff. And that's what it is. And so, Hey, we identify all those models. Great. You can go forward. So this is what, I, when I started learning this, when somebody brought it up to me and I went to a boardroom meeting, Dustin Reyna invited me there in December this past year. And I met these two, um, investors, Ishmael and Luis, and they were telling me they were crushing it doing the majority of their deals were novations and they were just crushing them doing a whole bunch, 15, 20 of them a month. 
And I'm like, you're doing that many flips? And like, no, not not flips or whatever, like wholesaling the flips. He goes, we're just listing them on the properties. Like properties are a turnkey, bro. I was like, what do you mean? And he breaks it down. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm so pissed off. I didn't see this. Like, what the hell? And so I'm going to explain it to you. So the reality is this. There's a lot of times where you come across properties and the homeowners open to selling the property, you find out is in a really good condition or it's a decent condition. You just know it's not fucked up. It doesn't need to be a low wholesale cash offer. That's why it's not getting accepted. So you find out an example, maybe the house is worth 250 and it's as is condition. You've identified that just kind of running comps and hearing that, yeah, this sounds pretty good. It sounds like nothing's messed up, right? So if it, everything's actually true, sounds like look at the comps for properties worth it, like 250, you know, and, and you start negotiating, you start talking and you try to get a number out of her. Maybe she's at 200, 210, 190, 200, in between those numbers right there, more or less. And your true MAO cash is like 120, 130. So you're like 50, 60, 70 grand away. But this person, this homeowner is actually giving you a discount from what it's worth on the market. Like easily, if they just were to list it, they can capitalize on the uh, the difference of it, right, themselves. But if they don't know that and you know that, you can come up because the way that I'll show you how to break down, how to like structure, how to underwrite the deal is what you'll do is you, instead of looking for ARV, you look for as is value and that becomes your ARV. And then what you do is you multiply, you, you basically take 8% off of that number minus your assignment fee and that's your cash offer right there so now the reality is you're most likely getting a property locked up at 80 percent of of its as is value and here's the thing if the homeowner is getting everybody if every wholesaler is a real wholesaler knowing how to do the real numbers right and a cash buyer is a little bit stronger by like 10 grand everybody's down at 130 140 this homeowner is like 190 200 and so for all of us wholesalers or cash buyers at 120, 130, none of us are going to be able to buy this. And even if you go and pitch creative, what if they just, the, the goal wouldn't be, try, it would be to try to close it. But the reason why I'm saying if you try to go creative and let's say you don't, you find out it doesn't work, it's because it happened to me on a, on a deal recently where that happened where I went creative after cash. I tried to do this innovation thing or no, what, what happened was, I was tagged in on this, one of our leads from our acquisition managers. He went cash to creative. So when I came back, I talked about the creative offer and what they thought and they said no. So then I pitched the innovation and it worked, but that's because I, I forgot that it's because I got tagged in. But on the, the, the innovation part, so like from cash, we were at 120, 130. She, the homeowner or him, they were at 190, 200, it's worth 250. And so if you run your numbers, and you're like, you already know how to structure it. And you're like, okay, I've identified it's as his value is 250. And then you took off 8% and you're like, hmm, I want to make 20 grand. And you found out that your cash offer was 210 or 190-ish, 180-ish. Let's just say that it ends up being 180 or something like that, right? At that moment, you could lock it up at 180. If, I mean, you could send that offer over at 180, right? But the goal is to be the one that's closest to their offer, right? So it, once you know that the ball's kind of in your park, you've asked enough questions to say, where are all your cash offers at? Why didn't you take them? What about those creative offers? Those, those are stronger than mine. Why didn't you take them? And you now realize that your innovation offer is right in the money where, where they want to be. doesn't mean you need to give them exactly what they want. Sometimes you're going to have to during, just to get the deal done. But when you know already nobody else is up their cash and yours is a cash offer on the innovation, it's a cash offer. And they don't want to be creative though they had some pretty strong offers and they're declining them. Now you don't have to do that 190. You don't have to do that 180. You can do 165, 170. And, and because you're the closest one to achieving their goal, you're most likely going to win. And if that doesn't work, you have wiggle room to meet them exactly where they need to be. And I was just trying to explain that you can make a deal sweetened out, make it a little bit juicier for yourself. Now I'm going to break it down on a whiteboard so you guys can visualize it. My screen's touchscreen, so I'm going to use my finger. So if it's shitty, who cares or whatever. Like my 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 uh, my art skills, right? There we go. Yeah, but I can guarantee a lot of us have these in, in our current pipeline. A lot of us do.
And so there are some things that you do have to verbalize and there's some special verbiage and documents that you have to have. You do have to kind of, you do have to say some things like you're going to be using an agent. You're going to be getting part, um, paid by selling your contract to a third party and things like this. So there's a few things you're going to say and I'll go over a pitch. And that pitch was really, I just got it from Rich Wonders uh, mentorship. So I didn't really change it. I kind of adjusted it, but really all the meat and potatoes are straight from his pitch. It was really good. All right, so everybody can see the whiteboard, yeah? On the bottom right corner, you can zoom out, zoom out to like, I don't know, 33%. All right. Any questions so far? Now, are these novation type deals the way you're the way you're underwriting them and the disposition is it are you wholesaling it to somebody else nope another investor or is this more of like just a uh, between you and the buyer or you and the seller and then you guys when you sell it it's just yeah, you two. Yeah. so it, it's it's funny because we we're the ones that list it for them a lot of people since since we're that that's how i know a lot of us store novices is because we're trying to find out how do we disco it it's us. We are the we are the ones disposing it. We're the ones. Uh, we're basically all we're doing is saying, hey, Michael, can I list your property for you? Since you're not trying to do it, since you're not opening your fucking eyes, knowing that your property is sixty thousand dollars. I mean, it's worth sixty thousand dollars more than I'm offering you, or that you're asking for. That's basically what I'm saying, but I'm not saying that, you know. And so now there there are people there are people I've heard say that shit to them. I, I could just list it for you, and I'm like. Why would you just throw that out? Because the reality is a lot of them would just rather list it for themselves, though some don't want to because I've come across people who would say, hey, I just, I'll, you know, I need a little help. And then I've heard people say, I can list it for you and that worked. But yeah, that's not, I get, I get. That's not like that. Yeah. With the, the, we have a property in San Diego that it's, uh, I'm, I'm just realizing right <laughs> now that the, it is a innovation what we're doing. Yeah. And we're not, so, we're not, we're, we're not really doing anything where we, Took it. We literally paid the guy forty five bucks to uh, to take the house subject to, and then we lifted it back on the market because he just he didn't have the time, or we solved something else besides price that other people couldn't solve. So okay, okay. Yeah. So basically, whole tail, sub tail, very similar without you actually closing on the deal. Sub tail, whole tail, very similar, but you don't close on the deal. Whole tail, you have to buy the property, list it, do that stuff for like a double close. And then subtail, you have to buy it, right? That will have, pay closing costs on whatever the terms you agreed to and then list it. So innovation in, a, in an agent realm, like if you're an agent yourself right now, it's something called like a net listing, which is basically, let's say you're a pretty solid agent in your market, you know, the area and the data and what properties can sell for, right? So you're a performer. So you realize that. Let's say a homeowner says, hey, hey, Carlos, can you list my property? And I ask him, yeah, cool, go over a whole bunch of things. How much do you want for it? 300 grand. And I realized, okay, if I would have sold it for 300 grand, you know, my 3%, what am I going to make on that, right? Whatever, nine grand or something, right? And so if I knew that that property, is, as his condition was worth 350, but this homeowner was only asking 300, I could say, yeah, I could do that. And instead of paying me commission, I'll just go ahead and, and we, I'll give you the, I'll go ahead and list it for 300 and then whatever I could sell it for above that would just be my commission. Right. And so they saw for 350, the agent's going to make 50 G's instead of 300. Right. So that's the net list. You're giving them the net price. Okay, cool. Now you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that if you weren't knowledgeable. Cause you know, what if you didn't make shit? <laughs> what if you just worked for free at that moment? So obviously to me, I mean, it just made sense. I mean, co using common sense, I'm sure somebody who's knowledgeable knows the market very well. If somebody's under asking their value, I can see why somebody would capitalize on that, right? And so that's another way to view this is very similar. All we're going to be doing is listing it for them. So that's why you need to say proper. You also need to verbalize these things, but then you have the proper documents. Like you're going to need an attorney in fact and an indemnic in a novation and identification document. So to me, I always thought innovation kind of meant like a partnership. Like I learned it from Pace and was like, hey, you can do like a fix and flip. And then recently, Caleb Christopher 
he was like, yeah, we're not doing any partnerships. Let's call it assignment for to rehab and, and resell. And I like that because it, it makes me distinguish how to look at it now. So, but anyways, I always thought it was like, hey, let me partner with you. I'm, which basically I'm not going to have to pay for the house. I just renovate it, make my money on the renovation after we pay commissions and blah, blah, blah. Right. So I never really knew how to view it, never dove into it. And then I get into this side. I'm like, oh my God, this is a lot better for me to do it. And so when I break it down, I'll break it down on a, on a higher price point than this last time. I said 250, I'll go ahead up to 350. I'm sure you guys are coming across a lot of properties at the 350, 450 range or whatnot. And e even at a million dollar range, I'm going to show you like how cool this is, how you can work on turnkey properties, properties that have equity in there are great, all this stuff. Let me go ahead and uh, let's say MAO. M -A Oh. let's say we're at 240 right that's where we needed to be let's say asking price was 290 or let's say 295 and let's say as no oh wait as is value is 350 grand right so the goal would be this right you're going to qualify you jump on your phone call whether it's cold whether it's a warmly follow up wherever the hell it is right you kind of qualify that you go through the pillars always go cash that's your best bet. Always go cash. Even if this, this property, even if the property does make sense for a cash offer, like they are like open at 240, still lock it up in ovation because you're just going to listen and get a lot higher of a number. You get what I'm saying? So no matter what, like Rich wonders whether his cash offer works or not, he's going to lock it up in ovation. Even if it's, it's like, oh yeah, my 240 does work. And they're like, yeah, it does work. Cool. We're still going to do innovation because I'm just going to list it and have a buyer who's going to pay a lot more than your other like investors are. And so you go, you go through your whole spiel, however you structure your, your conversations and your deals, you, you rule out cash. In my process, in my structure, this comes after ruling out cash. We go dive into innovation. And, um, and I'll go over the pitch right now, but I'm just going to break down the rest of this concept. And I'm going to go over the pitch that Rich put together and then I kind of just like adjusted it a little bit, but it's, it's pretty solid and it gets every everything out that you need to say and to know. And it's pretty strategic. I like it a lot. So you get to you get to the point where you, you you're comping the property and you're like, hmm, as is values around 350. As homeowners at 295. Everybody on mute, please. Uh, as his value is 350 and the, the homeowner is asking for 295 and you come out to 240 and, and however you you try to counter right hey how come you can't what what about 240 doesn't work with you okay how close to my number can you get to is there any wiggle room from that number you find out no there isn't you're running comps now now for novation whether you're getting off the phone call and taking time to underwrite it whether you're strategically just getting off the phone call psychologically so you can get the documents ready to send over because you now know that this novation is going to work so you might as well just assume the close and send it over however you're you're going to do that you now comp the property and you realize yeah i take 350 right mm -hmm. so we take three hundred and fifty thousand, and i said okay take eight percent off of that number so 350 times 8%, right, is 28 grand. So take 350, take away 20,000. We're at 322,000. So take away 28K. So there's a there's a little um, there's a little zoom in and zoom out. Where is it at? On the bottom right corner, there's a little um, 
Sorry. Can you guys see it now? Is that better? There you go. Everybody has to zoom out a little bit. So you go down to the, the whiteboard, zoom in, zoom out, zoom, zoom out to 20%. Yeah, everybody got it? Okay, so if, I, if you guys weren't able to see my bad, I zoomed out enough now where hopefully everybody can see everything. So uh, MAO 240, right? We couldn't get it. 295, we can't do this cash. You're either going to get off the phone call or you're going to go and pitch creative, if, if that's what you know, creative, right? If you don't, then you're not. You're off the phone. Creative doesn't work? Okay, you let this go, right? Hold on, let me see. Everybody, everybody's good. I see a lot of messages coming in and out. Everybody's good. Chilling. All right, we're tracking forward. So, three hundred fifty thousand uh, take away eight percent as twenty eight grand. That twenty eight thousand dollars is going to take care of commissions to agents, which is like six percent, and uh, closing costs and things like that. Now you can get the end buyer to pay closing costs, and you can save yourself. Now here's a couple things. What if you know? What if the property could be cleaned up lightly and maybe painted and it could be worth 380. That's your decision to make. If you would decide you want to put $10,000 in there real quick, get it cleaned up and painted and then get another 20, $30,000 on your end. That's up to you. But there's a lot of times you don't have to do anything. Sometimes the homeowner might request you um, to pay for uh, moving all the stuff out of like a shipping container or something like that. Maybe they don't have the money for it right now. So you'll put a little bit more money into the deal or whatever, but you got to calculate that. But for a property, just for educational purposes on this one, since we're not using a case, we're not doing a case study on a live deal. Um, we're gonna we're just gonna list it, and I'll go over a case study on a live deal. But the we're just gonna list it as is. We're not gonna touch it. We're just gonna go ahead and list this thing, lock it up, and then go ahead and list it. So at three fifty minus twenty eight thousand to pay commissions and everything, the six percent of commissions, two percent for miscellaneous costs and closing costs or whatever, All right? So we're left with three hundred and twenty two grand minus how much money do you want to make yourself, right? As an assignment fee, and maybe give yourself some wiggle room because your goal at this three fifty, if the property is worth three fifty, you're gonna to want to list it for three fifty. But what makes it easier for you to sell the property a little bit quicker is to make it attractive and sell it for a little bit less than what the value is. So it gets sold quicker because at the end of the day, you need to move on this quickly. You want to be able to do this in 30 to 45 days and not take forever so you can get the contract. But at the same time, it takes a little bit of time from when a homeowner says, yes, I want that house and maybe doesn't have an approval ready for it because your end buyer is just a retail home buyer, a family or whatever that's going to go to the bank and bring third party financing to the table. That's what I believe innovation is, is I always thought it was the partnership thing. And then I, I recently learned that through this, that I believe the innovation is when, so, when you sell the property to a third party that's bringing financing to the table. How long does it take a third party financing or how long does it take for a third party to get financing? I don't know, maybe 30 to 45 days. Somebody knows, put it in the side chat. I don't know. I've never got... I've never used conventional financing. I've only jumped into creative finance last year and bought everything on terms and borrowing money. So I've never used hard money or conventional loans. I rent the house where I live at. So I would never know. I don't know. Um, 350 minus 20,000 is 322. Let's say you want to make $20,000, right? Then $302,000 is where you can actually, that's your MAO on your innovation right there, $302,000. Depending if you're like, hey, do I want to discount this a few thousand? That's That can come out of this, or you can reduce your price. If you want to say, hey, I don't want to sell at $350, i am going to market it for $343, and you, but you still want to make twenty grand, then you have to take $7,000 off of, off of this purchase price or you know reduce it in your commission it could work but now you can see how your cash offer is very very attractive because now you can come up to three hundred and two thousand dollars right 302 295 you're at 240 but who's to say if you came in at 285 who's to say they wouldn't say yes to that right because you now really know if you've asked all the questions you know that, oh man, they don't have uh, anybody higher than 240 cash. And I definitely can give them 295. 
but I want to be conservative because I want to make sure that the market be able to sell it quickly. It doesn't take time. And so if I have to reduce the price very quickly, I want to make sure I have enough wiggle room. So what a lot of people will do is they'll go instead of 8% right here, they'll go 12% to give them that wiggle room, like the soft anchor, right? 12% and then you know that you really need eight, right? Your maximum allowable is always going to be there, but you can go your soft anchors. 12% and then give yourself $30,000 $30, or $40,000 in, in the novation fee. And then, you know, whatever, if, it, if you're a little bit off, you have that wiggle room. And if you end up getting it done, like I said, you end up coming down here, maybe, maybe because you have to, or maybe because you're just going to go and attempt to make it sweeter and it works good for you. And if it doesn't work, you have 4% to, to wiggle around with right here and some money to wiggle around right here with. But more or less, you guys all have this straight up in your CRM, in your pipeline. You guys all have properties like this where you're like, yep, nope, they're giving a discount, but yeah, I'm too far away. Whatever. Dead lead. Dead lead. I even pitch creative and they don't want to do it because at the end of the day, they don't have to. They have to want to do that. Right? So at the end of the day, dead lead or long-term follow-up. Any questions on that? I'm going to take off the whiteboard. Yeah, Carlos. So just to confirm, you you calculated the the realtor commission and then you took 20K off of that, right? Just to sell it faster. So you so how you underwrite, so you know how if you're looking for uh, if you're trying to get a wholesale cash offer and you're gonna sell it to a fix and flip or to an end buyer, you're like, hmm, my MAO, this end buyer, I know he's buying at 78% of the ARV. And for me to make a commission, I got the minus the 70%, uh, the 78% minus repairs, then my commission, right? Well, we're going to just listen to a retail buyer. So what you're doing is you're taking the AR, the ARV on this property is the, the as is value. So ARV is 400, but as is is 350, take 350 and then now take 12% off for conservative, to be conservative, 12%, anywhere from eight to 12, really 8% can do it if there doesn't have to be much money spent or any spent any money spent at all. 8% is what you need, but you could take 12% off that number and give yourself 20, $30,000 as a, as a fee. And then you have some wiggle room from giving your fee, you can reduce it, you know, obviously. So you have that wiggle room by giving yourself a larger fee. So your structure is a little different. You'll just take the ARV, which is the as is value, Take off 10% minus your fee. Got it. But you do want to take off at least some of it just to, for it to sell quickly, right? Because you can't like put it for- it's a, Yeah, support. it's easy. You don't have to. Like the, the thing is, if you do it, you have 45 days. If you put 45 day close and you put it on the day, like on the market for the first day, check it out for the first week. I did it and it happened. It happened for me. So it just depends. Like the market, the market's a hot market. You're gonna get stuff, you know. All you gotta do is just beat the all the other properties by a little bit. Right. Okay. Let me Thanks. go ahead and bring up a calculator. Actually, watch. Let me see where it's at. Hey, Carlos, are you looking for these houses to be vacant already, or is it okay if there are people are still living in it? Vacant. So you you're just you want to have them vacant because they're gonna you're gonna use an agent. So I'm gonna break down the pitch. I'm gonna break down how you just how you can just call an agent and kind of update them on how it works, what you're doing. Now you, you get this attorney. In fact, the stronger document to get is a power of attorney for the MLS. It might scare the person just because they have to get it notarized. But an attorney, in fact, is like a lighter version that allows you to work with the agent. I'm going to bring up this calculator so I can show you guys this calculator. I'll, I'll leave it in the side chat. Yeah, Carlos, the key to the transaction is the real estate broker. And one of the questions you want to ask the real estate broker is what's the 30-day sale price? You may not use that number, but you want to know from them if, if they're the right real estate broker, what's the 30-day sold price? You know, what number would you have to set the list price at that they're going to put on the MLS? in order to get the property sold in 30 days or less. That's clean. Thank you so much. That's a good concept. That's why I love you, Bill. You're the best.
All right, I'm going to go ahead and share screen so you guys can see this calculator, and then I'm going to leave the calculator in the side chat. See, yep, I have one in mind that might work. Cool, yeah, we can work them. I'm going to show you how to pitch them. We'll get into all the calls. We'll do it live, too. I don't mind working deals with you. We can start whenever you guys are ready. But here, I'm going to share this screen real quick. So this calculator already adjusts, I think, for like just 8% already. So ARV, right, is going to be your as-is. So whether you want to put... Um, you want to put as is there, you can change it or whatever, but you, you just know your as is value is your new ARV value. So let's go use that example, like I was saying. 350,000. 28 grand, like I was saying. So this calculator is at 8%. So this, cal this novation calculator came from Corey something, Corey, Corey Greer or something like that. He's a, he has a novation program. And so this calculator, it's, it's straight uh, formatted straight for that. So it, it does the 8%. And then right here, it shows you your after costs, meaning that 8%, here's exactly what you're going to have left. And then if you need to update it, like I said, if you wanted to paint it, you wanted to clean it, or you do need to fix some of the certain things um, to get it sold quickly, you'd put that number in there, then your fee, then your max offer would come right here. So, you know, a couple of things, what's the population of the city and how far from a known city? as well. It helps it out. Easier to get them done in a large city, but this also works in like cities that are like 20, 30 minutes away from the larger cities. It's an easy way to get them the highest cash offer too. Even though we think that the server, server um, or those like those um, properties that are just like out of country or whatever, they are good for creative, but a lot, at the end of the day, the homeowner has to be down to do that. So this calculator, we throw in 350, you see your innovation fees at 28,000. After cost, you're at 322. Let's just say this property doesn't need a lot of work. Let's say maybe you can just clean it up, like get a deep clean in there and move out the, the furniture and things like that. And then you want $25,000. However you guys want it. I know Rich puts 30,000 in his. He always puts 30. I think his is like, I think his structure is exactly like that, like 8% minus 30 grand, or I forgot what it was. He'll come and show you guys on in a couple of weeks. We already have a scheduled date and everything. We're going to be putting up a, a flyer and everything so you guys could uh, save the date. So at the end of the day, your offer would be 287. But if you come over here, a cash offer, right? We roll over here knowing that we want to make 30 grand as, as an assignment fee and it needs five grand in updates. 70%, like where people are buying, our cash offer is 210, right? From 210 to 287, look how, how much the difference is. Same, it's a cash offer. What if you, you have a buyer at 75%? Okay, this is where you have to be. If you want to make 30 grand, right? Obviously, if you just want to make 10 grand, you're up, you're up 20 Gs right here. You're at 247, right? So it just depends on where you want to be. The same thing, 80%. Your max is 245. That's if you're at 30 grand. You want to make 10 grand? You're at 265. Your max offer is 307 on the novation. You come up a lot more, right? Be conservative. Put a little heftier fee in there so you have conservability in there. You know? Boom. Right here. 292. Who the hell has leads right now? They're like, ah shit. This right here is fire as fuck. This is juice right here. And you're like, oh shit, this is going to work. I'm going to call a whole bunch of these leads back and get this popping. You guys have this in your, in your CRM, don't you? I'm going to show you guys how Rich came up with this pitch. It's fucking amazing. I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing this screen. I'm going to go ahead and attach this into the side chat so you guys can all grab it and start toying around with it. And then uh, underwriting your own deals, looking at where you guys can be. So one for sure, you need to get photos. For sure, you don't want a shitty property you list in this crap or whatever, right? So for sure, get some freaking photos on it. Ask very detailed questions on, on the condition. So get a little bit better asking questions, right? I had just did a video two days ago on a transaction. I put it on YouTube and asked a, a few detailed questions on the condition so I can identify it pretty well. And that'll help you out. But if you can get the photos, you can really see it's in good condition, then you're really solid. It makes you more confident, right? Yeah, Carlos, the reason why that's so important 
is because, you know, I, I was a real estate agent and broker in two states for many, many years. And when you're dealing with res when you're dealing with residential buyers, it's a whole different ball game than dealing with an investor buyer. Or, you know, a fix and flip. Oh, yeah. You know, that's a whole different uh, category or person than dealing with a residential buyer that's going to be moving into the property. And this is going to be the home for him or her and their family. So they're going to hire a professional property inspector and they're going to come through the property. And that's why it's so important for you to identify the condition up front because they're, and most likely they're going to come through and have a whole punch list of stuff that they want you to fix before they close. And so just understand that's the real world and that's what you're going to deal with. So you might be better served to fix the, fix the items in the property or, you know, set aside more than 8%, um, you know, as fix up costs because you're going to have to go ahead and fix that. And their lender, in most cases, will not allow, you know, a cash allowance at closing. The lender is going to want the items fixed before closing, especially if it's an FHA loan. So just understand that's the real world that you're going to be dealing with and, uh, and just prepare for it. Thank you so much, Bill. Appreciate yeah. that, and everybody. That's so true. So these are little things. I'm I'm a novice at novation. At the end of the year, we're gonna destroy yeah. it. But yeah, I got I'm a question, what's up? I got a question. It's uh, for you or for uh, for William Millen. Uh, pleasure to meet you, man. Thank you so much for what you do and popping in here and and you know just doing you know just get like, uh, your proper knowledge. So the question I got is, I underwrite a. I worked with the fix and flipper where we underwrote a lot of fix and flip novations. Now, one of the things that we would when we in talking to sellers. We would always find out how much they owed on their mortgage. And then we would take into account the fix and flip, the resale cost, et cetera. And what we would tell our sellers would be, we can guarantee you after we pay off your mortgage that you're going to walk away with X, right? So we would put that X in a lien against the property for the novations and at selling, that's how we would guarantee their, their walk away money. In this style of novation, is, are, you, are you doing it the, the same or how would you advise that we secure like that innovation that we, that I was thinking about it now, we actually had to do a double close because we're walking away with maybe like 40 at the end of it. And we're just saving the guy's credit. And yeah. we ended up doing close because we we're running the risk of like, he might see how, the spread that we were going to get on this innovation and it's just paint and carpet. Yeah. Uh, so we double close so he wouldn't, then come back and be like, no, wait, I want a piece of that now because I'm seeing how much money you're making. Do you guys get paid out on the lien or on, on like an assignment? It's going to be like originally, like how you're doing it before that, before your double it close. For, I think it would be, um, how would it be? See, Mike might be the better person to ask on that one, but okay. I would say it's assignment. So an assignment's not the way to go because at the end of the day, first off, if you're transparent and you're bringing value, like I just explained, you now come up to innovation and you'd be transparent enough and you bring right value. At the end of the day, they're going to see the HUD statement. They're going to sign off on it. They're going to be okay. Talk to all the people who really crush it. They're going to be okay with it. Sometimes they're not. And you have a little bit of a pickle right there, right? The assignment isn't the way you're going to get paid out. The way that you're supposed to get paid out is once you've identified the potential end buyer, Right. You're putting them on contract and everything, and you found out the spread that you're going to make. You put that number and you file that uh, as a lien on the property. And at the close of escrow, you release the lien. And uh, when when the money is deposited in escrow, it's going to go ahead and pay off all the you know the the liens in position, right? The mortgage, if there's one, and then the money will get paid out through the lien through the hood. And that's how you secure yourself. When some people have lost it, where they put money into it like that, and then the homeowner was like, nah, and they disputed it, and there wasn't enough protection. So there are other ways to be a little bit more protected in this. The way to the way if you could, which could be a little bit harder and could could lose a deal sometimes in it, is and would be preferred by me it would be to do a subtail. Would be for you to lock up the deal and have complete control of it. So you see the HUD statements and you sign off on your own and they don't have to see. But that might not work because they might not be like, I don't want you to close on it, and then take 30 to 45 days to do what you're doing. Right. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. And, and on some of them we did do the liens, yeah. 
Yeah, that would be the strongest way to go instead of the innovation. If you could do that, I'd prefer that. If not, you're totally fine with this, with the right paperwork in place. And then, you know, knowing how to do the, the documents afterwards. You, like I said, if you're transparent enough and you helping out somebody, Michael, through saving the credit, they probably weren't going to trip. You can even ask up front. You don't, you know, or you won't mind if I make some money on this, right? If you say these things up front, I know it's a little uncomfortable, but at the end of the day, it's what you do. I trained my whole team on how to be exactly like that up front. And it's not that you're rude or anything. It's just that you're setting expectations and they're kind of already aware. And if you're definitely dealing with somebody going through some stuff, you're the only one in your head thinking that they really need you. You ever been in a pickle where you're just willing to freaking take a loss? You know, and you're like, I'll, I'll even give them something when I get something, right? Like that's what happens. You're taking something off of their plate and they're thankful. They don't care. They weren't in a position to make the money themselves. But sometimes, you, sometimes you can though. I, I totally get it. Sometimes you can have people to make to like yeah and i'm thinking about it now actually no it, it, it is the 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 way of the lean i guess the, the way you're explaining it right now because we did have the situation where we were pitching an ovation and i remember i remember in the negotiations we told them look we believe we can sell it at this price so we're gonna we're gonna you know put everything in liens against the property and then if it sells over this then we have an agreement we'll split anything above this at 50 50 because we've we've guaranteed you your money we've guaranteed our money and then we if we sell it at this price if it goes for more then any, anything above that is, is an unexpected bonus and we'll split it at whatever, 60-40 or 50-50. Yeah, and I would never do that again after having my conversation with Caleb now knowing, hey, no, there's this is, this kitchen already has too many cooks. What I'm going to do is how much money do you need? What do you need out of this? And then the rest I'll have to deal with myself. You know, I'm going to have to pay my my employees. I'm going to have to take care of material and everything like that. And then my commissions after, my, my money after paying out the realtors or whatever it is, right? So now it's like, no partnership, no giving away. See, I never knew how to look at the fix and flip style. I never knew how to underwrite it and, and know what, how do I know what type of profit to make if after you run the numbers, how much percentage? I didn't know how to do that exact number. I'm not a fix and flipper. I never looked at innovations, only looked at it once or twice. And then I got on to a phone call, working a live lead with Caleb and Bill Welch. And at the end of the call, he was like, I was, he was like, hey, listen, he says, I put this one on YouTube. He talks about, so there, there's no partnership. And I never brought that word up in the conversation. It's just that that's exactly how I thought of it too, though. And that's because how everybody says it. And I've heard of people, not not only you, Michael, but I've heard of other people who, who say things like that, where they'll take a split with them. They they say similar things. And in my head, I, I thought, why can't we just make the most of it if we can give them their number, almost like the net listing. But see, I started getting ideas from other people that were doing them. So I didn't know how to look at it. And he tells me, no, no, no. He says, we're not looking. He's like, yeah, this innovation. He goes, sorry, sorry. Assignment to rehab and resell. And at that moment, I don't call, I don't think of innovation anymore as, as a fix and flip. Right, right at that moment in my head, I was like, cool, I'm gonna right there, just when he said that I identified it, and I'm gonna call it assignment because then what he said after made a lot of sense. He goes, We're not here to partner with them or do this. He's like, we're gonna give them what they're looking for. So be firm on what they can do and how much they want or whatever. And if we can make that make sense, give them that. But there's no all this extra shit promising partnering them wanting to do shit or delegate you how to do stuff because you said partner now let's give them an idea how to paint the house or all these things no nothing like that he goes there's already a lot of cooks in the kitchen and we're not going to do this he goes so you give them their net price and then everything else is for us to deal with and at that moment i was like, all right cool so i'm going to still look at it that way but everybody has their own structure that's why there's so many different people i just now look at the innovation as i'm not going to get into a headache or a an argument later because the things went out. I'm just going to set expectations right up front and say, hey, this is what I, how much do you need? Hmm, we can do it. We'll do it. If not, we need to be right here. At the end of the day, you're higher than all the other cash fix and flippers and wholesalers in this cash model. Hey, hey, Carlos, two things. Number one, the reason you can't do an assignment and an ovation is because the end buyer's lender will not allow it. That's all you need to know. You can't oh. do an assignment and an ovation because you have a conventional lender involved and they're going to disapprove an assignment transaction. That's all you need to know. So you can't do an assignment and an ovation. The second thing that you need to realize is that in several states across the country, a net listing is not legal. You know, real estate brokers cannot do a net listing. You know, they're prohibited from doing that either by rules from the Real Estate Commission or through state statutes. 
So, you know, just be aware that you can't do a net listing in many states and a real estate broker can't be involved in that type of transaction or they'll lose their real estate license. So just understand what the rules and regulations are in the real estate market in which you deal. Yeah. And a lot you have to find the right title company. So you have to do a little bit of research, right? So right title companies, closings, uh, best to find agents that can do this nationwide. If not, like best to find agents that you can either, you know, be compatible with and then kind of put them up to game. Find somebody in sub two or TTP that's an agent that might, you know, be a little bit more open to it. But easiest to, you know, to have all parties to be a little experienced in, in these areas. So um Mike, did you have another question? You good? I'm gonna, I'm gonna. No, no, no questions. Sorry, I'm like getting my kids ready to take them to that baby class. Cool. I'm gonna go ahead and and pitch the the novation pitch for you guys, right? And I've heard a lot of different people say a lot of different things, and they work, right? Everything, everybody, everybody has their own pitch or their own style or whatever they learn from. Um, I got the concept. And then from getting the concept, I really got the best pitch out there was from Mitch Wonders. It's a good, it's a good pitch. He calls it, he calls it the concierge service. And because I already work with a lot of programs in our business, and I say that word all the time, we just call it another program in our business too. And then we also call it the concierge service, but it goes along with our scripts and goes along with our, our flow chart and our structure and everything, because we already prepare and set expectations and explain business models up front. So they know that we're underwriting deals while we're talking to them. We're pretty strategic in the way that we, we work deals now. And so you kind of go through your cash offering and it doesn't work. The way that I would roll into it is say, hey, you know, whether it's a follow-up call because you need to take time to underwrite it or whether you were going to do this right on the same call right after cash. I would say usually how I, I would change it. I'm like, okay, cool. That, that cash offer obviously didn't work. I would try to get some wiggle room out of it. Why didn't it work? Is there anything close to it to see if they can take a lower number? And if not, I'd say, okay, great. Well, you know, I did tell you a little bit earlier, we have some programs. I'm still underwriting it to see which one you're going to get approved for. I'm pretty sure we'll get one of the, we'll get one of them to get you an approval. And as you're really looking, that's just taking the time to comp. You could even say that. Yeah. And right now I'm still looking, I'm still reviewing, I'm comping the property and you're still chatting with them. And then this is kind of how the pitch, how Rich put it. And then, I, like I said, I kind of just tweaked it just a little bit. But I would say something like, okay, great. We just got an approval right now. And oh my, here we go. So yeah, you got approved for our new program. It's called the concierge service. So I got some good news. I'm going to go over it for you real quick. You got approved for this concierge service. And what it is really, it's it's a, it's like a white glove service. It's, it's something that we provide. And basically what it does is it allows us to pay more for your property while still keeping this an all cash transaction. And basically from doing so many transactions in the state of whatever state you're doing this in, you know, we've, we've built out the proper systems, the tools, the resources in place to get property sold pretty quick. And so basically we just developed a large network of retail buyers that purchase our fix and flips. And the ones who weren't able to purchase our last flip, they're going to be sitting on the wait list, maybe waiting for the next flip. So there's going to be times where we come across properties that are not a great fit for us, kind of like this one, but it would be a great fit for them. So what I'll do is I'll have my staff reach out to them to see if this property fits their needs. And if it does, the great thing is our company will step in and pay for all the closing costs. We can move on your timeline and we'll buy the property completely as is. So you don't need to lift another finger or put additional money into this. And just to be clear, we're not going to represent you as a realtor. I just wanted to say that. And the reason I bring that up is because we're not realtors. We're an investment company. I let you know that up front. And though we work with our own realtors to list our flips, they wouldn't be representing you. So whatever cost that happens to be associated with the realtors will be paid by us. And since we don't have any flips available, what we're going to do is we're going to be reselling our agreement with you to this third to our third party retail buyer. And they're going to go ahead and pay us a fee. We're going to collect it directly from them. And this process, it could take about 30 to 45 days. And if we can get it some, if we can get it done sooner, we will. And then you, your offer, right? You give your offer and go firm right here. So, hey, you could assume it, right? Cool. We got you right at that 195 where you need to be, even if you're a little bit lower, right? However, you're going to pitch that number. But you see now in there, I was strategic. Rich was strategic. And then, like I said, I took the meat and potatoes in there. And then I put my own story in there a little bit. And so I, I put that all together real quick. Like I said, took as many potatoes, concierge service, kind of like building a re robust network and all that stuff and kind of put the little my own little story together. And um, 
yeah, I basically brought up that I'm not a realtor. We're going to be using a realtor that's on my team. And I'm going to call some retail buyers that are on a list. I don't have a list. I don't fix and flip. I don't work with any agents in that damn market. But I did say that I, I do all of that because I verbalize it. I'm going to use an agent. But if I happen not to, then we won't use it. But you already said it. I'm going to use an agent. And if we don't happen to use it, oh, well. But if we do use one, I'll pay for it. So it takes their mind off of why can't I just list it? You know, it's very strategic. And then you just say same things. Hey, like it's still an all cash offer. We can close completely as is and blah, 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 blah. And now all you're going to do is list it for them with the right documents that allow you to work with agents, which is an attorney, in fact, or a power of attorney for the MLS, because you don't own the property and you can't market the property unless you have control of the contract or unless you're licensed, right? So you can't market it. So you definitely need that stuff. But that was more or less the pitch. How strategic was the pitch, though? Pretty cool, right? How it's just basically saying, hey, motherfucker, I'm going to list it for you. What do you guys think? Good pitch or what? That's a great pitch. Love it. Gonna use it now. Go hit up Rich. You know, go go hit him up. He did a great job. Like I said, everybody just tweaks their own little things, but he did a great job putting it together. I learned some of it from Omar Lopez as well. And then me and actually just putting things together. I put some stuff together and yeah. Sounds great. I said everything I needed to say and then follow up with documents. What is the most common objections to that pitch? That's a good question. I haven't. Well, the, the good overcomer is, uh, hey, I just don't have time to do all this. Well, that's great because you're pretty much doing everything for them. All they got to do is sign. Yeah. Give me give me like some examples. What questions would you guys have? Right. And then I'll I'll answer them right now with whatever I think of. I'm pretty sure they're like what happens is the, the ones I've been doing, I didn't have. I just got to know, like, no, that still doesn't work because my number and I'll ask them why or whatever, right? But there's a lot less, there's a lot less objections, but some of the objections I could have are like, why would you need to use an agent, right? So like, why would you need to use an agent? They're on my team and the agent, this is, I would right now just thinking of it, right? Well, the agents are on our team and they have the best knowledge for data and they have MLS access. So we use them on every deal that we buy, right? Boom, confident answer real quick, overcame that. Um, I can imagine, can you do it sooner? Well, I don't think the reality is I don't think you can do it sooner because you need that time frame, right? You can, I did one in 17 days, but it's because the property, the potential, the buyer that ended up buying our house was already approved, trying to buy a house in that market in that city. And every time they went to go and buy the house, it was sold under them. So they're like, when they came in, they're like, we'll close in 16 days. And they paid $10,000 more than, or 15 grand more than everybody. Cause they were in a certain situation. They didn't want to lose the house. So we got an offer at 15 grand over asking because we just were in the market and somebody was like getting, somebody was sleeping on the houses they wanted to buy. And so they came with a strong offer for us. What other questions? So will people- now, Why would you, a seller ask, why would you have to put a lien against my property? Oh, that's a good question. I hadn't verbalized that to them, you know? So I don't tell them anything about putting a lien on the property or anything. Well, in most cases, you're gonna you're gonna have to have a. You don't have to verbalize that, but just to answer, you have to have the legal authority to do that. Yeah. Um, but just to answer it, just thinking of it right now, I could I would just because I'm just a transparent, confident person. I always let people know I'm doing this to also make money. Um, if somebody said, "Why would you put a lien on the property?" I mean, any reason that same person, uh, any any business would really do that if they did some type of work with you to protect the way that they would get paid. I've heard lots of stories. I'm just thinking of this right now, right? Being a salesman, lots of stories of business owners who didn't pay some of these GCs and they try to sell their business and their GC put a lien for the amount of money that they owed them, right? And all I'm just, that's how I do it. That's my company policy. That's probably what I would have said. I just thought of it right now. Like I said, I never bring up the lien, but just me being a salesman, how quick I, quick I can think on my feet, that was right there live for you. I've never had to answer that question. And if I can't overcome it, it's all well. Sometimes we lose it and I'll learn, I'll learn to live for another day and I'll call on the superheroes that know how to do it better than I do. Yeah, when we would pitch it you know, on the, the lean topic with that, we would say that like, you know, so we're going to put a lien against the property. That's how we can secure your payout. That's how we can secure our private money lenders get paid back. 
for the money we borrowed to fix and flip the property or something. And that's what we would say that we would put a lien against the property to secure that you are going to get yeah. it because it's then it's secured against the hard assets. So when we sell it, that has to get paid. And yeah. we would just position ourselves like towards the end by the first, second, third, whatever, however many positions there were. And, uh, you know, we, we would say like we're putting ourselves in one of the worst positions because we're going to get paid last. Your mortgage gets paid first. You get paid second. Private money lenders get paid third. And then if it doesn't sell out with the price we want, we may have to come out of pocket or we may not get the money that we're expecting to make on this because we have to make sure everybody gets paid first. We're getting paid last. Yeah, very true. An objection. So will people need to walk through my house? You know, most people would love to see their house, you know, the house that they're going to buy, just like walking into a dealership and looking for the car that you're going to buy. I'd want, I'd assume that, but here's one thing I'd never show up unannounced to your property. What I'll do is I'll just gather one day where I can get the ones who are really interested and not trying to waste my time on yours. And we'll spend one or two hours at your property. So either I'll give you a couple of hundred bucks so you and your family can take a lunch while we do this. And then you come back and we want to have to look at it again, right off my head. I would have said something like that. Very simple, right? You guys need to do this too. So a lot of these questions actually just come from us being nervous or thinking of what what if they say this, right? And that's good to say that. But like I say, if you can be very transparent and you're confident with what you say, like you, you can transfer certainty. Like this person sounds pretty solid at what he does. I believe him. He has authority in how he's talking, kind of like you get pulled over from a cop and a cop says, step out of the vehicle and you don't know your rights and you step out, you just assume that he's right because he's the cop with authority, even though you don't have to step out of the car because you don't know your rights. You don't know how to stand firm. And that's how you live your entire life because you don't, you don't know how to stand firm for yourself, right? And so reality is people always tell me this shit all the time from agents to homeowners. Oh, wait, you're not trying to wholesale this, right? No, absolutely. I'm trying to wholesale this. Yeah, yeah. So here, here's the thing. I'm an investment company, right? I wholesale. That's how I started off. We flip properties. I mainly buy and hold. I buy and then I wholesale. I buy some and I wholesale some. And as a business, why the heck would I not want to capitalize off of wholesaling a property? I have the lights to turn on, right? I have, I have overhead. This is what we do, right? So I'm going to end up at the end of the day, I'm going to bring you the price that you're looking for. And we move on. We just straight, I straight move it on. I move on to the next question because I don't, I don't pause to wait for a deciding that I don't leave that to be a deciding factor and for them to say, oh, are you, oh, then for me to be like, are you okay with me continuing on this phone call? Cause I'm a wholesaler, right? Every time I get it and I overcome it, they're like, no, you're right. I even have some in my emails from agents. Wait, you're not planning to wholesale this property, are you? I said, no, absolutely. We're planning to wholesale this. But who else is the only one able to talk to you this deep and trying to help them out of this? Like, I do buy as well, but I'm not looking to buy this property at all myself. Oh, okay. Well, the homeowner doesn't want it to be wholesale. Well, then we can't work on this. I'm going to wholesale it. Otherwise, who else has the same offer? And they're like, no, you're right. I was like, just ask them. There's nothing wrong with me doing this. You're doing the same thing. I'm just not licensed. And it's just stay quiet. <laughs> this is true. I'm not licensed, so we're doing the same exact shit. We're marketing for them. We just have to put it on paper. Same exact shit. We're like basically unlicensed real estate, real professionals. Is the power of attorney or attorney in fact that removes any problems with the lender paying? No. So you need the uh, you need the novation indemnification paperwork um, for the, if there's going to be somebody who's bringing financing to the table. Power of attorney is more recommended. You want to get the power of attorney if you can for the MLS access, mortgage, ins mortgage insurance, stuff like that. So then you could you could list it with the agent because some brokers are like, nope, I won't work unless you have the power of attorney. I don't want this attorney. In fact, it won't work with us. The attorney, in fact, just needs signatures. It's very light. In the pitch, how you said, hey, I may or may not use uh, agents when they have to go over that. Hey, why does this say that you're going to list this? Remember when I said I may or may not use agents? This allows me to work with my agent if I need to. Remember, I'm not licensed and I didn't buy your house yet. So I can't show your house to anybody unless I own it. And they're like, oh, I get you. So I just I overcome that real quick. But the power of attorney is what I'd rather get. And you could still get it. It's still very simple if you're upfront with everything. But so it's a little, sometimes it, you'll have some backlash because like they think, oh shit, I'm signing away something more important or something, you know? Attorney, in fact, is a lighter version. Just signature, power of attorney needs to be notarized and recorded. Uh huh. What are the questions you guys have? Have you ever gotten any pushback from telling the seller I'm gonna I'm going to what I'm going to this contract during your pitch or what? 
What'd you say, Isaiah? You can ask the question, brother. Have you ever gotten what I'm going to sell this contract during your pitch? Yeah, I say it. I say it in the pitch. If they ask the question, I don't lie. I teach my team that we're so transparent. We really are more transparent than most people. We're, I'm going to start up live calls. I'm going to be calling all your guys' leads and closing them all in front of you. And you're going to be like, whoa, I didn't know you can stand firm like that. I didn't know that you can do that. That's because you didn't know. Like, like I just said, you just didn't know. Remember in this industry, if we're wholesaling right now, we're trying to capitalize on wholesaling, you're a salesman. You might be an investor who has, you have an investment company, whether you have a portfolio or not, you're, you're an investor, yes. But your position right now as a salesman, if you're the one that's calling and doing acquisitions, right? You are a salesman. Right now, today in this era of time, we have the worst salesman of all fucking time because nobody cares. You have a pulse, you're hired. Fill the position, go and read the module, go and watch the modules or whatever, and then get out there, bare ass minimum skills. How are you going to go? How are you going to get into a position that, that provides income for your business and throw the most novice of motherfuckers in that position? And if you're in the position of making yourself money, how the fuck are you going to go and watch every Zoom out there on how to wholesale a property after it's locked up? How to perform on a creative finance deal after it's locked up. How to buy an Airbnb and do the Airbnb after it's fucking locked up, right? So how is that going to happen if all you're doing is learning what to do after it's fucking locked up? And if you're trying to lock up fucking deals and you don't know how to do it, whose fucking fault is that? Yours. And so you, if you see novices coming in here and all they're doing is trying to be salesmen nine to five and you're seeing them online every day. Hey, I'm, I'm, I called a hundred people today. Da, da, da. That motherfucker who's a novice is going to whoop your ass because you're not doing shit. You're not being a full-time salesman for your position. You need to get off the fucking Zooms for a quick second. Stop jumping on every fucking train and going and trying to do every single thing. Like I said, if you're trying to make money, you need to be a full-time salesman in your business and not just open and confident to being on the fucking phone. That is not enough to compete against me, at least, or compete against other people who are professionals. What you need to do is you need to role play. You want to be a professional like LeBron James or Tom Brady or Pace more of your brand down. So you got to fucking practice just as hard. Otherwise, take your time, your sweet time, which is fine, right? You got to do that shit. You got to work hard. You got to spend time studying and training. And here's the thing. It's not just about studying and training and role playing with people who are open to doing it with you. That's great and all to start you off. There's, some, there's, there's a law of practice and law of accumulation and, and, and everything that you practice at, whether you practice good or bad, you get really good at that habit. And the law of accumulation, you do it over time and it solidifies itself. It's like, a, it's like a subconscious habit now. So you go and practice with all these people who role play and they all fucking suck ass and you're a professional person who sucks ass. You have to go and fucking work with people who know what the fuck they're doing because then when you practice their habits, you're practicing winning habits. If there are winners in life and motherfuckers over here, they call them losers. They're just people who haven't found out to win. Most of us on this fucking side, right when we lost the first time of our dream or some type of goal we're going after, first time we fucking tried and we failed and we lost without it, we were, it was it. And we stopped. That's why I brought up earlier, I want to do firefighting again, Daniel, is because I was this motherfucker who kept taking an L and was like, it's not for me. I wasn't responsible enough. I wasn't mature enough. I didn't have you know, the mindset that I have now to win. I just didn't know how to fucking win, but I was willing at that time to work just as hard. My dumb ass now woke up and said, yo, wait, I could fucking win. I can still go back. I'm still young. I can still get hired. I can still do that shit. I still have opportunity to win. I just need to figure out the way to win. So stop being on this side of not knowing how to win, which we call motherfuckers losers, right? We have to learn how to win. Come over here. And so if you're trying to be a, an investor and you're just trying to buy, great. Go and talk to all of us so we know your buy box. If you're trying to close your own fucking deals, go and learn how to close deals. Don't just learn wholesale. It's going to be harder in the history of ever right now going through this economy that we're in right now. Not Everybody's not buying at 90%, 80% anymore. You know, cash isn't the way to go at the moment. It, it happens. I'm not saying don't knock it off or anything. It's going to happen. You're going to still close deals all the time. The thing is, it's not going to be as consistent, right? It's harder now for homeowners to say, how are you going to offer me 60 cents on the dollar when motherfuckers are paying 90 cents on the dollar last year? They're not in the market to understand what we see, right? So your wholesale cash offer, like I said earlier, you're doing nobody but you a service unless you're driving for dollars because you're marketing to the right person. At the end of the day, how, how, how is the condition of their house? And if they're open to selling, are you the right person that has the right program to buy the house, right? 
go and learn to practice. We're going to start, like I said, I'm going to start coming in here maybe once or twice a week in the next, I'll probably start next week or the week after. And I'm going to start closing my own leads with my team. I'm going to close your guys' leads and that's it. We're all going to do hardcore sales, but I'm just going to do it live and show you guys how simple it really is. Stop recording this right here, guys.